Philly Startup Leaders presents the 2013 Founder Factory Conference. This program was recorded November 21st, 2013 at the World Cafe Live in Philadelphia. Founder Factory thanks these sponsors for their continued financial support. In this video, scaling sales and buttoning up. Is scaling to sell to enterprise the right decision and what then? A conversation with Brendan McCorkle, founder and CEO of Cloudmine, and Bob Moore, CEO of RJ Metrics. All right, so I think most, most people have stopped shuffling, which is good. So I hope you're all full um, and awake from the food, because now we're going to call up a few more people that uh, have been rather prominent in the Philly tech scene, um, in the Philly entrepreneurial scene. Uh, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of conversations that happen. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce two guys that are leading and growing um, some staples of the Philly community. Um, and they're going to come up and talk a little bit. I'll let them introduce themselves on that part, but talk about uh, what it takes to grow and scale a sales team, when to get into sales, um, and how to proceed with moving forward with growing a business as a whole. So um, we have Brendan McCorkle from Cloudmine, and we have Bob Moore from RJ Metrics. Um, so without further ado, I'll let you guys come take it from there. We're going to steal chairs like the guys this morning did. Um, and if I was smart, uh, this morning I would have done what Mike just did and said, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves instead of forgetting Tony's name. <laughs> All right, well, I guess we're introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Brendan McCorkle. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloudmine. Um, we, have a, a, we build an enterprise mobility platform. Um, we actually work downstairs from these guys. Uh, cool. I'm uh, Bob Moore, the CEO and co-founder of RJ Metrics. Uh, we help online businesses make smarter decisions using their data, and uh, we work upstairs from these guys. So we've been tasked with talking about scaling an, a, a sales organization, um, and I thought that a good place to start would be trying to figure out what you're selling. So, so both RJ Metrics and Cloudmine started selling one thing and now sell another. Um, so I'm going to take sort of the first stab at sort of why we changed. Um, so, so for those who don't know our story, when we started building uh, Cloudmine, we started building a product that was for independent developers. And actually before that, we were building a product that was for us, uh, and, and mobile developers wanted to use this engine that we were building for their apps. Okay, well it wasn't an engine and it wasn't for sale, but one of our first lessons in sales was, but that's what the market actually wanted, so it needed to become the product. So before there were salespeople, before we had a sales pitch or a target, there's this first step of like, what are you actually selling? Um, and that can, be, that can be sort of the first pain in scaling is that's not usually what you started with. So I think because we're talking about scale, I think it's important to just throw out there that I think most people who come into entrepreneurship come into entrepreneurship because they have this great idea. Um, and it pains me to say this as a sort of now a converted idea person, that idea doesn't matter at all. It still kind of hurts. I like twitch when I say that. It doesn't matter at all. It's table stakes. Right? The rest of the game is learning in the market. That's what sales is. That's what business development is. Let me rephrase it. Sales at a startup is business development, not sales. Sales at a big organization is sales because you have a script and you have a product and you know what you're selling and you know who you're selling it to and you go do it a thousand times. Sales at a startup is we have something that we think solves a pain and we think someone's going to pay something for it and I need to figure out if that pain is real and if they'll pay for it and what they'll pay for it and how they'll pay for it. And all of that's business development. Once you f can answer all of those questions and now you want to get an army of salespeople to go tell that one story, that's one of those ways where you could say maybe we're not a startup anymore. So that's my framework. Of the, like when we talk about startup sales, it's really heavy on the BD side. Um, how we got out of the sort of first two we were wrongs uh, and maybe we were still unaware wrong, we'll, we'll, that'll, that'll come out in the wash. But what we think we're right now has come from just putting something in front of a customer, talking to customers and asking them what they need. Um, so the first step, I think, in growing a sales organization is figuring out what you're actually selling. Uh, and our flavor of that has always been asking customers where their pain points are, and hopefully there's some overlap. If there's a little bit of overlap, even if it's only 10%, we can start there and build towards the other 90%. Cool. And I think for us, um, one thing that I'm very happy about is while the, the method by which we've sold the product and the, the face of the product has changed uh, over the time when we've been building the business, 
one thing that I think we've stayed pretty true to is our vision, um, which I think is, is really important to build in such a way that it transcends the specifics of the products. So our, our vision as a company is to inspire and empower data-driven people. Um, and over the course of our Dimetrics history, you know, we've started out with this absolute ideal that I think a lot of people at very early stages have, which is that we want to build a company that's like 37 signals. And when I say like 37 signals, I mean you're selling a product that people will pay a non-trivial amount of money for tens or hundreds of dollars per month, but you will never really have to interact with them at all. If they want to show up to your website at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, sign up for an account, give you money, uh, and start using your product and getting value out of it, then they can do that. There are companies out there that have been successful with that model, the GitHubs of the world, the Fog Creek softwares of the world, um, but by and large, as you look at businesses that are selling into, not even necessarily large enterprises, but really just selling B2B, uh, selling into other companies, the reality that I think comes out in the cases that constitute the vast, vast majority of the universe is that there's a little bit more to the implementation and sales process, particularly in the early stages, that needs to be done in order to get it right. Um, and those components, I think, in a lot of ways, cause many B2B companies to drift from being a purely consumerized version of their ideal selves, which is where a lot of us start out, and I think is where we started out, and I think is where you guys started out, where it's like we have this dream version of you can flip a switch, pay a small amount of money, everyone in the world will use it, and we won't have to do any work, uh, to something that is somewhere in between there and the other extreme, which is having a consulting company and not a product company. Uh, and I think that we were really terrified in our early days about waking up one day and having accidentally built a consulting company. Not to knock consulting companies, you can build an amazing business uh, uh, consulting for people. And there are many amazing businesses uh, in Philly and in this room that have done so. But we, we set out to, to build a product that wanted to fulfill this vision. And I think in our early days, some of the biggest mistakes that we made were around never saying no to potential clients, which meant uh, tweaking our software in such a way that it would then, okay, now this crazy edge case feature will work for all of our clients, even though there's really only one client ever that's going to use it. Uh, and I think if you look at maybe you know, a year and a half, two years into us building the company, our, our code base was a total Frankenstein of our core vision and then all these weird little features that individuals needed. Um, and it was really at a, a point in time when we decided to uh, to really just focus down on a very specific core set of features when I think that course got righted quite a bit. But I'm not sure we could have gotten there without going through the consulting-esque phase because it taught us about the market. And we would not have gotten those customers in the first place. So I, I guess when, when I think about sales um, and sales in the context of business development for, for startups and particularly B2B startups, I think about that experience uh, and how our concept of selling initially was the, actually the absence of sales. It was that people would self-fulfill uh, and that people would completely consume and derive value from that. Today we have a sales team, it constitutes a non-trivial percentage of our staff. Uh, it's a very real part of our business and a very critical part of our business. And I think the transition between there and there is, is uh, probably the case studies that we'll, we'll dig into in the course of this conversation. So I wanna, I wanna ask you a question. How, uh how did you make your mind to say, you know what, it's time for founder sales to either stop or be augmented by a non, uh, an actual salesperson? Yeah, I think um, that decision uh, was made very, very gradually. Um, and I think it was actually kind of step through two of three. Step one was deciding that founder sales needed to exist in the first place, I guess. Uh, or that we needed to have someone there to actually talk to, to human beings. So my co-founder Jake, uh, who is a, an awesome sales guy and um, classic I build it, he sells it paradigm in, in, in day one, um, has uh, always been very, very of the same mind that we had in the early days that ideally he never needs to get on the phone with anybody either. Um, it's just kind of in those early conversations getting people comfortable where, where talking happened. And what tended to happen somewhat organically actually is that he was on the phone all the time. Uh, and we were, we were fortunate enough to be generating enough inbound leads through content marketing and PR and things like that that there were a lot of people who wanted to know more about our product. We have a, a relatively complicated product in the, in the grand scheme of, of things. 
Uh, and a human being needed to talk to somebody in order to close these deals. And it got to a point where uh, Jake was overloaded. Um, and I think that Jake is a super smart guy and we value his time a lot. And it, uh, you know, sales is extremely important, but we felt like having 100% of Jake's time being spent on sales was not the highest leverage use of his time. So we tried to find a way to, okay, let's dial this back to 50% and we can have someone who is on our analyst team picking up uh, some of the sales. And then it got to a point where we had a, a two-person sales force, we had a little bit of a dynamic, Jake had to be managing somebody, uh, but it worked. And having somebody who was a uh, less experienced recruit um, doing sales, uh, he turned out to be awesome at it. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate at a very small scale that we could put a dollar out and get more than a dollar back in on sales. And when that moment happens, Jake is fired. Uh, because we can bring in someone who's got the expertise around building out a sales organization where if we can show uh, a good ROI on an incremental salesperson when we have no sales infrastructure, it's a no-brainer to, to bring in the pros. I will, uh, I'll ask the same question of you. So when we started selling CloudMine, um, Mark, Ilya, and I were all really evangelizing our product. This, we were selling to independent developers, and this sales cycle was essentially five minutes. Someone would, in front of us, decide to create an account and start using it there, or like that weekend, or not. Uh, and we were playing a game of volume. We were playing a game of we need to sign up, you know, the sort of prototypical San Francisco, we need to get to a million users, we're going to be losing money, but this is a volume play, right? And, and, and although that didn't really feel like a business model we liked, we were starting down that path and we were playing that game. So all of us were, sales was sort of evangelism. We were telling people that they could do something in a new way, and in person we would show them or walk them through it and they would start doing it, they would tell us they were crazy, show us some gaps, and that was sort of our like dimensioning of a sale. Now, this was, we made something like $250 over 18 months with the, with the couple thousand people we had convinced to use our product. Um, that was one of our markers of something is wrong, right? People are excited about this, the market's excited about this, but uh, we are, we're not anywhere close to recovering the dollars that we're putting in. You know, the three people full time and we were covering $250 a year. This is really bad numbers. You don't want to stand in front of a board with those kind of numbers, right? Uh, for many of you who don't have boards, you don't really want to stand in front of a board ever. It's not that fun. Uh, but especially if you don't have good things to tell them, you don't want to stand in front of a board. Um, but we realized, and I think a lot of startups do this, that the amount of energy we were spending for that $250 was the same amount of energy that we could spend pursuing where these guys went to work during the week at Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Aetna and you know, Dell and uh, big companies. It's the same amount of work, it's the same conversations, it's the same you know, sort of leading a horse to water process, but at the end of it, there might be $5,000 a month instead of 90% of the people zero and 10% of the people $5 a month. So um, that was sort of our, our, our step one, was we're actually going to point the same product at these people. We're gonna, we've built a, a platform that can handle bigger use cases, but we're not putting in front of people who need connectors and, and higher levels of infrastructure. Uh, so we started doing that, um, and we very quickly learned that none of us, like our DNA as founders, was more evangelical than it was enterprise salesy. So very quickly we realized, none of us have closed a six-figure deal to anyone, ever. None of us have submitted an answer to an RFP, let alone win one. None of us have dealt with a nine-month sales cycle. We've been selling a like five-minute sales cycle for nine months. That doesn't really count. Um, so we decided to bring in somebody who had, it was not their first time at the rodeo. Um, and that was an interesting conversation for us because if you look at evaluating that person's success, we're still trying to do this, what Bob's talking about, dollar in, dollar out. Like, can we get to this place? If we get there, that's when we can bring on a second one. That's when we can bring on a third one. And no one will fault us if every salesperson we bring in brings in more money than they cost Bring them on. We'll hire as many as we can until that's not true, right? Well, someone who can lead an enterprise sales organization is not cheap, and the sales cycles might be nine months now. So there's nine months of spending a lot of dollars before actually getting to a place where you're comfortable proving that. Now, I'm thankful that our VP of sales has now actually demonstrated in the wild that he can make us more money than we spend on him. So that's a good, that's a good point. But it took us 10 months to actually be able to say, like to prove that to ourselves and to each other. Um, so that was sort of step two. Step three is then, okay, so if it's working with one person, 
can you repeat it? Um, and so we have one experienced salesperson, we have a relatively junior uh, management team in terms of selling enterprise, um, and we have an inside sales team. We now have three inside sales reps, all of whom are green, um, one of whom just introduced us, Mike, he's great. Um, but these are guys who haven't done, like Jay, our VP of sales, this, this is sort of their first or second rodeo. Uh, so it's been interesting to have now, now it gets murkier because we're not just spending for them, we're also ramping them up, we're also training them, we're all like, right? So, so where do you draw that line? But we all, I just always come back to a business model. We've taken venture money, we're building towards something. We're not, uh, you know, I, I admire Will from Sierra, who you heard from earlier greatly because he has towed more of an organic line and, and bootstrap, but we're already down, like we're on the venture path. We've taken investor money, so like some of our decisions are made for us. We will probably lose money on that one to one dollar a lot because it's our business model and that's our road. So I don't think we, we don't, or at least I don't feel like we have the luxury of making every decision on our, am I getting an ROI on this dollar? Our business enterprise SaaS model companies, they, we raise 20 to 40 million dollars and then sell for over 100 million. But we raised one and a half, so there's more money raising in our future, there's more burning and we're gonna go, you know, salary, 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 salary as the SaaS grows and, and that's sort of the nature of CloudMine for the next two years. And along there we have to figure out, okay, well how many salespeople, like, everyone we do makes the trough deeper. So that's sort of the, the, the scale for sales for us now is where do we hedge on, we have a product, people are buying it, they're liking what we say about our competitors, they like what they, we say about our price, but if I hire 10 inside sales guys, I just cut off a third of my runway. How confident am I that our sales cycle is nine months, not 10? I might need that 10 month. I might need that 11th month. So that's where the tension at our phase now, sort of step three or four is, okay, so what's next? Um, so I pass it back to you. Now you have a sales team. Now you have sales management. What's, what's changing internal at RJ Metrics? I, th I think the, 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 uh, the secret underlining is we started a product company. We might now be a sales company. Right? So we have 12 people and that, that shift, we might lose people. We might hire a different kind of person. Our culture is changing. Do you have any thoughts on culture change as sales grows? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are a lot of things that can and, and will impact culture when it comes to, to scaling, not just the sales side of the organization, but the organization as a whole. Uh, and when I think about it, you know, this, Jake and I went through this process when we raised our Series A. Um, because if you look at, I mean, look on Technically Philly or something and you'll find an unlimited number of quotes from me four years ago saying, we're never going to raise money or we are, we're bootstrapping this company. Um, and I think that that, that model uh, is very, very effective if you can figure out how to uh, build a business that's a little bit more like Fog Creek or a little bit more like those, those kind of self-service SaaS products. But uh, exactly what you were speaking to there creates this really interesting thing where uh, you know, it's, it's obvious from what you just said, but I'll say it out loud. Uh, while those nine or ten months of sales cycle are going on, you're not making any money. You're, you're sitting around uh, spending money, and you need to be really confident that that money is going to come back in. So the, the, the question, there's kind of two phases of questions. The first one is getting confident in that first nine or ten months that you're going to actually get those first dollars over those really long sales cycles. And during that point in time, when you're spending that much capital, uh, you need to think to yourself that there are one of two outcomes there. One of them is that it is not effective, uh, and we have burned nine or ten months and burned a whole bunch of capital, and we're in this position where uh, not only have we not found a sales model that works, but we're also out of money. The other thing that might happen is that it might work. And when you think about your fundraising options in that side of the universe. Think about what you have proven there. What you've proven is that you can invest some money today, you can wait nine or 10 months, and you can get more money than that back. So make it easy, so you put a dollar in and get $2 back out over that time period. Why would you not want to immediately put one, two, five, 10, 20 million dollars into that channel, assuming that you're, you're confident about the, the, the scalability of it? Um, I think that's precisely the analysis that, that we did that led us to say, look, there are uh, 
uh, we're starting to prove out that we can invest money and make a return on it over a time period. And we see where we can spend these dollars and we don't have the dollars uh, because if we wait to organically add the customers, the speed at which we're able to ramp that spending is just not aggressive enough to, to be competitive in our industry. So it, uh, the nice thing is that if you have a little bit of evidence proven out that you can, you can uh, get that kind of return on sales investment, then getting access to outside capital is not necessarily going to be a, a very difficult thing. Um, but the trickiness is kind of in that interim period, that kind of nine to 10 months when you're, you're figuring out at first. But fortunately for us, we were able to, to raise the money and in the past year we've gone from, from 18 people to 42 or 43. So the question comes back to, what happens culturally when, and by the way, when we were 18 people, that was 15 developers and three people doing other things. And now at 43, it's more like a 50-50 split. Our dev team has only grown to 21, 22, and the rest of the business is salespeople, uh, data analysts, which is part of our customer success program, account managers, uh, and people in, in administrative roles and, and marketing roles. So uh, when that happens to your organization, how do you not get a sense of corruption, particularly among the core product team, where the business has suddenly gone from being something that's very, very product and technology centric into something that is more sales centric. And I think for us, uh, the solution has always been, when we are hiring on the technology and the product side, I think one of the things that we screen for is people with entrepreneurial tendencies. Um, there's a couple reasons that's really good for us. Uh, one of them is because people who are entrepreneurs tend to be intrinsically motivated uh, and tend to be extremely motivated by their work. Uh, even sometimes if it's not the work of the company that they own or that they founded, uh, the work that they are doing uh, is something that they are going to pour their hearts into. Uh, and I think that that's translated really well for us. The other thing is that it keeps us honest uh, because in the case where you are employing someone with entrepreneurial tendencies and you are boring them on the job or your company is not uh, doing what you set out to do initially, they will leave and go start their own company or join another entrepreneurial company. I mean, that's, that's like just the, yeah, that's, uh, uh, we've, we've both certainly uh, in, in darker days had, uh, had losses over that. Um, and I think what we've been able to do really well over the course of ramping up sales is get everyone in the organization on the same page around getting really, really excited about what it means to be successful financially as a business, not just from a we're all going to get rich perspective, but from a this is how we can do amazing things in our industry with our technology to our market as a result of that. And the truth of the matter is that if we triple our sales in the next year, our ability to staff up on the development side condense our technology roadmap so that we're accomplishing the things we want to accomplish faster uh, and really make a bigger impact on even more people, uh, it matters. Uh, you know, we, can, we can change the pace at which we as a company make a difference in the world by being more financially successful. And I think uh, we've got this cool thing in our office where anytime we get a new sale, uh, this automatic uh, thing starts spinning and it rings a big gong on our wall. Uh, and the developers are dancing around when the gong rings just as much as the sales team is. And I think it's because not people are saying, oh, I'm going to make my quota and get paid out on this, or, oh, uh, you know, my equity is now worth that much more, my stock options are going to be worth more, I'm going to be rich. It's like, oh, what we're doing here matters to another person, to another company. And the impact of what I'm building day in, day out is, is bigger and better. Uh, and I think that we we as a team are able to bond over that and bond about caring about the fact that, that what we're doing is, is something that's, that's changing things for some people. And I think uh, that's, that's a function of just what the, the type of person that we've tried to bring in. Uh, and I think we've been really happy to find that as we hire on the sales side and as we hire on the account management side and the analyst side, those people are out there. And they're actually out there and more, more readily available in roles like that, where people that definitely uh, I always ask in every single job interview, would you want to start your own company one day? And most people say yes, and then I ask, why don't you just go start it today? Uh, and I love hearing the answer to that question, and there's a lot of really good answers to that question, um, but just seeing how much people have thought through entrepreneurship um, really translates well into being a player at a startup, not just a startup that's five people, but I think a startup that's you know, sub 200 people, you can, it can really impact the way you play a role. So, uh, that's how our culture is surviving, uh, and I'm, I'm optimistic about being able to, to keep it that way. Um, I'll pull a question out of the blue for you, which I, uh, you told me to make it, make it interesting up here, so I'll, I'll throw a, a controversial question into the mix. Um, so, you talked about how starting out uh, 
very much your sales model was around being evangelist and selling to developers. And I think a lot of the, the visions around changing the way that developers develop and making a big impact on this, this enormous ecosystem of people out there that are developing. And if you ask the you that started that company, uh, hey, what do you think about selling six-figure contracts to big, giant enterprises? Uh, I, I speculate that that you back then would have said, that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, it sounds like, like the worst thing in the world and super boring. And uh, so maybe uh, can the you today talk to the you from then and explain why this is something that is uh, true to the right direction for your company? Well, so there's like a safe answer and a not safe answer, right? So I think we've done, we've done a lot of things incredibly foolishly at CloudMine, and we've done a couple things really well consistently. One of the things I'm proudest of is that we've always had an ear really close to the market. So we got pulled off of a B2C product to expose our platform before we were even done building the first product because it was so clear that people were asking for something other than what we were building. Um, when we couldn't sell it to the individual developers and we were losing the volume game, we were big enough to admit that we were losing the volume game and then we hadn't cracked the nut on that side, but we kept running into enterprise developers who wanted to use this at work um, and that what we had built was almost accidentally the right product for them because it was the same person. We grew in Philly and the, the, the people we thought we were targeting as independent developers had day jobs at all these big enterprises. So their use cases were actually their use cases from work, not their use cases from home. So we were like building this enterprise enterprise grade platform and we had no idea that we were doing that on the product side because we thought we were building it for these independent developers. So it, it, uh, at some days I think I feel like we stumbled into it and other days I feel like we were like led by the ear into it. Um, but it was the same process of just trying to spend as much time as possible in front of the customer and actually listen to what they were saying. They were not asking for what we were building. Or the, the buyer has now changed. The product is similar. So it, uh, from a culture side, it hasn't been uh, too painful. Um, now, interesting, I was laughing when, when you were telling your story because our first engineer, we actually recruited away from RJ Metrics. So, so Bob and I joke about that. So he got bored at RJ Metrics. He came to CloudMine. He was our first engineer. I'll stick to the fact that we needed him more then, but Karma's kind of a bitch. He just left CloudMine <laughs> because he got bored. So uh, I sort of get, you know, we knew what we were paying for. Uh, and so our, our leg of that journey is, is over also now. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, you, you now get retribution from, or now I'm on this side of the fence being like, damn it, Derek. Uh, right. So, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. And I think that's the one case where I don't actually think the shift to enterprise is what made some of the product boring. I think that the problems are still interesting. They've just changed a little bit, right? So the first problem was this sort of black box you were talking about, where it's like, let's build a platform that someone can just sign up, plug an app into, and we never have to directly talk to them. We just built something that's so amorphous. It can plug into every use case. They'll pay us $500 a month, and it's okay, because there's going to be 100,000 of them. Um, well, now there's like 13 of them. So they can't be paying us $500 a month. That doesn't come anywhere close to covering the team of 12, right? Um, and their problems aren't necessarily boring or, or, or not challenging for the engineers, because now the person who wants to come in and just start developing an app is actually going to point 20 million users at it on day one. It's not going to ramp up because they just launched a product. It's an active engagement with a brand like Coca-Cola. So they have, when they release that to the app store, it doesn't have 10 users in month one and 100 in month two and 500 in month three. It's got 7 million by the end of the first month, right? So it's like, you need to have different pipes, you need to have different engines, and you need, like, that's still hard. But we're still saying to a brand like Coca-Cola, you just plug in your stuff and it works. So that's, we still have really hard engineering problems internal, which keeps, I think, the product side of the house rewarded and engaged. It, but it's, it's been the focus of the sales, right? Um, a long way to say that I would tell old Brendan, you know, a year ago, Brendan, that uh, it will be one of the least painful pivots that I'm aware of because we didn't actually change anything on the product side. We still followed, our product roadmap is defined by what our customers tell us they need to have in the product and every feature we go through and try to say, will anyone ever use this again? The higher confidence we have in that decision, 
we get from talking to more customers so that when we've heard it twice, we can say more than one person would use this because two people have said yes, right? If the 12 of us can get two people in the mid-Atlantic to say they'd use it, there's probably a thousand people in the US who also would say that. When it's only one, you don't know. Is that that one person ever who wants this feature and you're just wasting your time? As soon as you hit it a second time, a third time, or with some of our features, everybody wants this. Okay, well that's a no-brainer, right? Um, so it's just like point the, point the phone number on your, on your uh, smile and dial this way. Point the, uh, look up the organization a little bit instead of down the organization. But it's the same core story. It's the same core product. It's just now we might have to have six meetings with someone in order for them to start using a platform instead of one evangelical, this is the future of application development. Um, so I, I actually think that's kind of a fun question. You guys have been at it a little longer than us. If today Bob was talking to like day one Bob, what would you say about what you've learned to like, you know, that was, this is, you're about to do something really dumb. I can save you a lot of time. Don't do this. Like the one thing you'd tell yourself to watch out for. Yeah, don't hire that guy. He's going to go to cloud mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a great question, and I think there are, there are hundreds of answers to it. I mean, most of the things that we did in the early days were the wrong things. Uh, and I think in some weird way, there's this little bit of what, what allows me to sleep at night, given those facts, is that the only way for us to learn that those were the wrong things were to get burned by them or to, to go through and experience them. I think that, I mean, if you look at it in the, in the universe of, of startups and venture-backed startups, we as a company, RJ Metrics, are kind of like the, the old guys in the room and that we were, we were founded in 2008. I mean, we just had our five-year company anniversary. And to be a Series A company, usually those companies are like six or 12 months old. And I think it's, if you look at those early days, the first entire 18 months was me and Jake in my attic. Uh, and then we had a year in Camden where we got enough money to hire one or two people. And then we moved into a, a small office in Philly and we kind of got to, to the fifth person. And it's really only been in the last 18 months to two years where we've seen this explosive growth in sales, in uh, customers, in growing out the team, uh, and in maturity of the product. Um, so I think that probably the, there are a few things that might have allowed us to accelerate that a little bit more. And I think that a lot of it relates to being honest with ourselves about what it really means to be selling to businesses and the fact that all the things that feel really uh, awful about enterprise or B2B sales are there for a reason. Um, and I'll give, a, I'll give a, a good example, which is um, services. Um, I, I worked at a venture capital firm before starting RJ Metrics, and there was basically this rule when we're valuing companies, you look at how much money they're making from products, and you, know, you multiply that by, by some multiple, and then you take how much money they're making on services, and you multiply that by zero, and you add those two numbers together, and that's what the company's worth. So like, the, the services revenue of these businesses was not something that you know, got a really, really commanding multiple that would contribute to valuation. So when you were selfishly thinking about starting a company, and trying to optimize for your own uh, personal outcome or the, your ability to build equity value and build a business that is, is valuable to your employees and your stockholders and everything else, you think about that product revenue, you think about that recurring revenue because the multiples you can get on that are so much higher uh, because they're not ephemeral like, like services revenue. They're, by definition, they're there to stay and they're predictable and that provides a, a level of stability that commands more value. So the reality though is if you go and look at every single SaaS company that has IPO'd over the course of the last five years and you dig into their financial statements, you're gonna see two things. Number one, you're gonna see a non-trivial amount of revenue coming from services. Uh, and number two, you're going to see services disguised as product revenue in a whole lot of cases. So you find a lot of companies where, and I'll even, I'll even use us as an example for this. So you know, we, we wanna help our customers be successful because they're using our product. So part of what we do is during our sales process, uh, we allow them to talk to really smart people uh, and during their onboarding process as well, smart people in our organization that deal with customers like them all day to help make sure that our product gets incorporated into their workflow in the right ways. If they have questions about what data should I be looking at, uh, to a certain extent for free as part of the onboarding process, we'll have conversations to help them. If they need a little more help, we'll engage with them on a paid services contract uh, to help them get a little farther. 
And the reality is that services revenue is not there because we want to get a big multiple on it and because it's going to contribute to our top line and because it, it helps the outcome. It's there because it helps our customers be successful while they're using our product and that's what allows the recurring revenue to not go away. Uh, in our very early days, we had you know churn rates that were like concerning to investors, and our churn rates are so much lower now. Uh, they're they're you know best in class kind of kind of grade churn, and it's because we talk to our clients. Uh, and it sounds it sounds so basic and obvious, but we didn't have anyone in our company whose title was account manager six months ago, uh, and now we have an account management team. And that account management team, every once in a while, reaches out to our clients who are paying us, in some cases, thousands of dollars a month and says, hey, how's it going? Anything else we could do for you? Uh, and that phone call, that five minute phone call, saves these you know, customer lifetime value in the, in the six figure customers and, and keeps them on. Um, so when you think about, oh, we're selling this product and we have this recurring revenue base that gets a really high multiple and it's software revenue, it's, uh, it's software as a service, the reality is that our software as a service cannot be successful today without having some kind of services or human component bundled right alongside of it. And the good news is that that happens everywhere. All these software as a service companies that you look at, with very, very few exceptions, do the same exact thing. And it's okay. It's okay to talk to your customers. It's okay to help them be successful. Even if it feels unscalable, the reality is that if you look at the economics, it's extremely scalable. And it's not a terrible thing to have a room full of account managers if that means that you've got hundreds or thousands of clients that, that they're addressing. So uh, 2008, Bob, uh, talk to your customers. I also think that, uh, I think Paul Graham said something about this. He's got a, a blog post about reminding entrepreneurs to do things that don't scale early on. I think we're a little neurotic with our obsession about scale. We're, today is all about scale. Um, but you don't have to build every piece of your entire machine for the three year from now, 100x larger than now, now. Every time with every element. Um, on the services side, it's really hard to scale service sales organizations. Um, Everyone focuses on like the Yammer and Salesforce and, and th these companies that have you know maybe 90% product, 10% service revenue now. Will was talking about the 10%. Here's my version of the 10%. That 10% is billions of dollars worth of service revenue. They do a lot of services still. It might only be 10%, but they do a lot of services. And when they were a year old, it was the other 90-10. It was 90% service, 10% project. It was probably 99-1 for the first 18 months, and then 90-10 for the next year, and then it started getting better. But that's what got them their first 16 customers. Because somebody, the conversation we have is, that sounds really great, and the proposition that they're getting is using our platform to develop against and having someone else, them or a third party, build the front end of the app. And then they say, but can you just do the whole thing? Okay, so they're showing buy, right? They're saying yes to a bigger number than we want them to say yes to. Why the hell would we say no when you've got someone like Adele or Coca-Cola saying, well, excuse me, but Brendan, can I pay you more than you're asking me for? You can have somebody else do the services. You can bring in a partner to do the services. That's actually something we're trying to get better at because we, we were pricing ourselves wrong where we didn't actually have the room to do that. So that's probably the 2014 Brendan is like, get better at this because we're still not quite there. But you can, have, you can have development partners to do the services, but this still lets you own the relationship. And sales is all about relationships. So that's the other thing that, that we've learned is that's no different than two years ago. It's still, are you connecting with the person? Are you em empathetic to what their needs are? Do you have a solution for their problem? And if you say no, it's okay, because salespeople never say no. So sometimes you say you don't have a good solution, you recommend something else, and all of a sudden, you now get recommended to one of their friends, who, by the way, has twice the budget and half the time to do it in, which is our whole value proposition, right? So we've seen that a couple times, too, where if you're problem solving and building relationships with your customers, you keep them and you land them. Now, the way we do that and the amount we spend on that, investors don't necessarily like seeing that and being like, oh, well, you're putting a dollar in and you're getting four back. But those first 10 customers, that first one customer, those first five customers, in your business, whatever that number is, that first N customers are the hardest N customers you will ever close. But services allow you to stay close to them. Maybe you get to put a, put a body on site we're launching one of our biggest deals uh, to date last week. So they want us to have 
three people on site. That's 60% of our engineering organization. That's painful for us. But it's the new pricing model. It's proper MRR. It's the ratio of services to income of maybe three to one instead of nine to one. That's what the, invest that's what the investors want to see. So for those of you on the funding track, it's not just services are done, services are low multiples. They just want to see movement. They want to see that the MRR is going up. They'll give you an arbitrary number. They just want to see it move. They just want to see growth, right? Uh, but putting those people on site is where we're going to learn how the people using the CloudMine platform are actually using the platform because it's going to be in front of their terminal in their office, not at ours. So if we're working at the platform in the Philadelphia building, we don't know how they're doing that, right? So we're getting, we're getting closer to our customer and they're paying for it. Uh, that's a pretty good value proposition for where most companies are early in their life cycle is many people would say underfunded. So your customer is funding you more, you're closer to your customer. I mean, this, this sounds like a good thing. I, w w one thing you reminded me of, um, Will, Will also made me think of this. Um, so, so Will doesn't really like sales. I, I, I'm a lot like Will. I think that people think I can sell, but I don't get a lot of personal enjoyment from selling. Um, but I believe incredibly strongly in founder sales. I think that no one in the company is as passionate as the founders are. And no one ever will be as passionate as the founders are. Your first couple sales, they're buying you, not your product. Um, so, so to a certain extent, I, I almost advocate holding off on bringing on a full-time salesperson because that person isn't you. They're, they're, they're not gonna, they don't have the story. They can't sit down and tell, hey, when there were three people at CloudMine, this is what we did. It's funny that you're talking about whatever they brought up that made you think about that. A lot of people in the enterprise especially are a little envious of folks who are at startups. They want that energy. They want that passion. They want that story. That's why they took a meeting with you and they're too busy for that meeting with you. They might not give that meeting to the VP of sales or inside sales guy A, B, C, right? Um, no offense, Mike, I know you have a name. Um, but like, they might not actually take that call uh, because it's not the guy at this exciting uh, startup. Um, and, and I think that a lot of founders are sort of like, but I'm not good at that, but I don't want to do that. And, and I think that like sales is one of those hats that it doesn't matter if you like it or not, like founder has to wear that hat for at least a while. Like you, you are going to be better at it than whoever you bring in because it's your baby. And everyone will be able to tell that it's your baby. Um, so, so I know that uh, Jake for you guys does or has done most of the sales. Uh, did you engage at all in, in founder sales early on or, or have you had temptation to or from that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was in a sales meeting yesterday, uh, and I think you know there there is it's exactly that phenomenon that, that you're talking about. Um, we uh, when we show up in the press or in a news article, I, I usually happen to be the one that gets quoted, and because of that, someone out there learns about the company, sees my name, finds me on LinkedIn, sends me an in message, and says, "Hey, can we meet?" And it looks like a really interesting prospect. My response to them cannot be hey, let me CC uh, my sales guy and you can have a conversation with him. Like that is not, you know, a lot of these, this is where sales as business development actually really comes true because a lot of those early sales conversations aren't even, hey, I want to buy your product. It's, uh, hey, I'd love to have a conversation about how we might be able to work together. So like they, they frame it as a, a, maybe there's a partnership, maybe there's something, but again, this is, you know, it's a young, exciting company. I want to get some exposure to them. If those conversations ever go anywhere interesting, nine times out of 10, it is down the sales path. But you can't avoid, as a founder, being deeply involved in that. And being able to sell and present uh, your vision and your product and what your company is there to do, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It needs to be in your DNA and you will end up in sales meetings uh, one way or another. Uh, so you might as well, uh, might as well you know, get, uh, get your feet wet as early on as possible. I think we're, uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, some questions, maybe, if, uh, if there's time for questions? Questions? You brought up the concept of channel partners. Yeah. Uh, that's a big part of the strategy to grow. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the, probably relevant to our hierarchy metrics as well. What, is, what are some of the decision points you're looking at as to when you do it, how to do it, you know, how much of the work you're looking for those partners to take on? Did my board send you here to ask me that question? Um, so we raised some money earlier this year with the premise that we were all in on channel strategies and it has almost categorically not worked. Um, so at least the way we thought it was going to work. It's actually working in a 
a different channel than we sort of put our bet on, um, which is just another life lesson. You know, just stay flexible and keep your ears open, right? Because we put we went all in here, and it was like actually here, still a channel, same difference. So um, channels are interesting. So. Uh, I think you can make a lot of patterns out of, uh, out of startup life and, and, and business work, right? So as a founder, I think we're responsible for putting fuel in the tank of the, of the business, right? The business needs fuel. You can get it from customers. You can get it from investors. You can get it from M&A. A company buys you, they're still running your business. They're still funding it. It's just internal. So you need to find, you need to find fuel from one of these three places. So sales is another thing where you can sort of subdivide that a little bit. You can sell direct, you can sell indirect through a partner, and then you can get a channel. Is, is more, it's, it's distribution. All sales is distribution. Most startups die like, we have the idea, we put a prototype out, we haven't raised any money, dead. The ones who make it through that valley of death, there's a second valley of death. The second valley of death is figuring out distribution. So I, I kind of use distribution and sales synonymously, but I think that's actually a much more serious valley because it's much longer and deeper. Channel sales is a way to multiply the power of your sales organization. So uh, Will talked about having active customers that evangelize your product to other people. That's a form of distribution because they're now telling other people about you. But that's like inbound marketing. Um, on the outbound side, so we sell to creative and interactive agencies, for example. That's, that's a channel for us. That's an indirect sale. So our relationship is with an agency. We work with Digitas Health here in Philly. That's, that's an example. Digitas Health owns the relationship with the brand. So the brand is consuming Digitas stuff built on top of CloudMine, but we don't talk to the brand, right? So this gives us the distribution because we don't have to go close Pharma A or Pharma B. Digitas does. We're not staffing the nine-month sales cycle that they have to close that deal. We have a very tight sales cycle with them because we've already closed them. So when they have a project, they bring it to us. Every additional project at Digitas is like a one-week sales cycle for us. They've got account managers. They've got project managers. They've got a sales team and we can stay just us, just the 12 of us, right? Uh, so that's, that's one channel, a sort of indir indirect, I guess that's a two-party sale. Um, there are other channels, and these are the ones that we thought were really exciting that are really, really hard to do. Um, and in our world, these are like the infrastructure vendors, like an Amazon Web Services or a Rackspace, somewhere where it's like putting our product on top of their product helps them sell their product. If we can convince them that that is true, their sales force will, sell, it will upsell us to their customers. Again, it's their sales force, it's their channel, it's their customers. That keeps our cost of acquiring an Amazon customer incredibly low. And it allows our reach of a sales organization to far outperform the three inside sales guy, the one gray hair we have, and the founders, right? And if you count all three of us, we're still only getting up to six people here. Um, that, that's what a channel allows you to do. So um, one of our advisors, uh, his terminology is arming a channel. So the strategy to attack a, a channel is to make sure that they have everything they need to sell you. They need to have the incentives to sell you. So they need to be compensated, whether it's a SPIF program, whether you take them out to dinner. Someone called this vendor steak, which I love that terminology, right? Like you take them for dinner, right? That meal is vendor steak. Um, whether it's vendor steak, whether, it, whether it's an actual SPIF, so there's commission or a referral bonus or some actual tangible benefit. Something that when Amazon person is in front of a potential or current Amazon customer, they say CloudMine instead of Amazon or as well as Amazon. There's some motivating factor that needs to be there. Channel managers are also account managers because let's just use Amazon because I've already brought them up. They have 37 or at the last time we talked to them, they have 37 salespeople selling Amazon Web Services. 37 people now need to know what CloudMine does, how we help their world, here are some use cases, here's a slide to drop in your deck, come to one of our pitches so you can hear how we talk about CloudMine, so you can see us close someone, because you're probably not going to do it as well as we do, so let's get you to see us do it a couple times so that you can now go out without us there, or maybe we collectively decide you got to bring us with you. Um, so there, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, and I think what I'm getting at is, what we learned is that actually arming a channel properly is really hard. So in the beginning, it's exciting because it's big, right? If they start selling CloudMine, look how far we'll go. Look how fast we'll go. But I don't think we properly appreciate how much work it takes to get the channel to actually respect you. Um, and with some of the bigger players, the ones we were most excited about, if we rewind to January, the ones I was in front of our board and our investors saying, this is the future of CloudMine, those channels still aren't firing. 
we're ahead of our numbers from the channel, but it's because of different channels. It's ones that it actually is much more efficient. Things more like Digitas, where like the gap between what they do and what we bring is narrower so that they get it quickly, right? So like, I see how I can sell you, or yes, what you bring us actually allows us to close customers faster. With some of the infrastructure vendors, we spend all of our time trying to convince them of that. We're, we're, we're ahead of the market with them. They don't believe that we help them sell them as much as they need to yet, but other channels do. So just like finding the right customer, just finding the right product market fit, there's a different channel for different, for different companies. And what works for CloudMine probably won't work for RJ Metrics. They're gonna have a distribution partner that's very different. They might need totally different assets. Bob and I could get coffee and talk channel strategy and everything I do that works might piss off his channel. So that is sort of the, the beautiful and frustrating thing of, of the startup world. explore different channels. If you find the channel, like you mentioned, if it's inactive or not very efficient, are you just keep it open or you will do something close it so you can put your energy in other relationships? So continuing to put en energy into it risks sort of the, the sunk cost fallacy, right? So just because we've put the energy into it doesn't mean it's any more likely to work just because we've put the energy in. Um, so we try to challenge ourselves with decisions that we've made that involve time and money. If we're saying no, but we should keep doing it, we try to challenge ourselves to say, yeah, but are we just saying that because we've already spent so much time or because of how much we wanted it to work? Um, we have taken our foot off the gas on the infrastructure channel. Um, so we, are, we have stopped putting time and money into it. Not entirely, but probably 90% less time and energy than we put into it the first three quarters of this year. Um, we're putting that same energy into other places that are showing more promise. Um, but it, it's sort of, it, it's, a, it's a hard conversation to have because channels can be, if done right, very rewarding. And one of the things that costs so much to manage them is if you don't do anything to them, they cool off, even the ones that like you, right? It's like any other relationship. You have to talk to those 37 guys once a week, just like they were current or prospective customers. We have to touch them once a week. Okay, so here we are making this, I, I have this hypothesis that if we use their 37, it will cost less than if we use our 37. But I have to talk to their 37 once a week but I'm doing that instead of talking to 37 prospects of ours. So you always have to come back and look at that, like what's the risk reward? Is it actually worth it? And we were all in on yes, and we've actually changed our mind. Um, and we're not all out, but we're, we're now cautiously pessimistic about that particular flavor of channel. And that was a painful decision because that was something, we stood up in front of our investors and our board and said, that's the future, guys. Are you coming with us? And they said yes. And now it's like, actually, um, about that. That's not exactly the future. Um, the future's still bright. Uh, it's just <laughs> over here a little bit. Um, and there, there's some emotional pressure about like, you know, you, you publicly said, hey, we're doing this and it's going to work. And then it didn't. Um, so I think you know, as long as you're, you're willing to have the, you know, self-awareness that, that uh, it's okay to make those mistakes. It's okay to place bets in more than one place and not all the bets are going to work. If the bets always work, we'd all just go gamble and none of us would do stuff like this. That's hard, right? So some, there, there's risk. Uh, I feel like I'm hogging the mic. I don't know if you guys do channels, so. Yeah, I, I to spend just, just 30 seconds on our learnings from the, the channel side. I mean, the main lesson that I think particularly for earlier stage companies to, to take away is do not half-ass your channel strategy. Either have a channel strategy or don't. Uh, and I think that what happens to a lot of businesses early on is that you will get inbound interest from people who look like potentially valuable channel partners. People will call you. And for us, this happened to us a lot with agencies. So we get a lot of inbound where people are saying, okay, we have a client and that client is in need of better analytics. Maybe we can become a channel partner for you. And we're sitting in a room with a small number of people uh, without a ton of budget to spend on legal, without any vendor agreements or uh, any history kind of negotiating um, you know, arrangements where who's managing the account management, who's doing X, Y, or Z. This is a major, major business decision. If you want to pursue channel, make it a strategic decision that you are pursuing channel. And I think in terms of flipping them on and off, in terms of uh, when they are working or not working, we think about it much more categorically than we do with respect to individual channel partners. So 
agencies for us have not worked well. Um, and I think it's partly due to the fact that we've, only, we've never done a great job of proactively pursuing good agency channel relationships. We've just taken calls from people who have called us. Uh, and mostly those people are calling out of, out of desperation or, or our shortcomings around not being able to develop a, a channel strategy and make it a failure. Where we've had a ton of success is in working with shopping carts, so people with complementary technologies, working with venture capital firms, so people who have portfolios of businesses that look very similar and are actually involved in the value delivery. So VCs love it when their portfolio companies use RJ Metrics because it gives them a uh, kind of a sneak peek into what's going to be shown at the board meeting. Um, so yeah, I think that we, uh, uh, we've seen a lot of opportunities to work with channels. We've burned a lot of time by not really focusing in. And when we did focus in, not only did we save hours and hours and hours by just not taking phone calls or politely passing on opportunities to have certain conversations, but by focusing in and proactively going after the ones that we know how to do, and we've already done all the legal work to set up correctly, uh, it works. But it's really easy to flail and have a quasi-channel strategy for as long as you're running the business. And I think that's something that a ton of businesses, even really big ones at scale, fall victim to. Did you guys um, investigate a sales agency with a bigger, large, baked sales force already in place to go to market with your product? Uh, investigate, I would say no. Have conversations about, uh, I would say yes. Um, we, we definitely looked at the possibility of leveraging third-party vendors to kind of take care of a lot of the, the infrastructure that's painful around scaling sales. I think for us, I think, those kinds of businesses work really well when your sales model is fully baked. So when you've got the pitch, when you have a reproducible sales cycle and sales experience, uh, I think it, it starts to make a lot more sense where you can slot in people that are strong, overall, generalist utility players in sales and they can make that happen for you. Um, for us, I think the reason why it has not been a realistic strategy to date is because Every sale is still just a little bit different, like just different enough that we need our VP of sales to be able to knock on my door and say, hey, can we handle this, this weird quirk in, in the software? Is, is this a, a case that we've seen before? Um, and the answers to those questions at the moment live in a small enough number of brains and are edge casey enough that it's, it's not practical to have an outside party doing that. I think at scale, that becomes a whole lot easier because you talk to enough prospects where you can get the 80-20 rule into effect and if you can have 80% of your sales going through an efficient channel like this and kicking the other 20 to an in-house, that might be an option for you. I think we're, we as a company are a long way away from that though. Yeah, I think our stance is similar. We've looked, we've looked into it a little bit. Um, I think we're, we're still, like, as I said earlier, still more BD than pure sales. So if we have a rep that's engaging a customer, they need to either be stupid enough or smart enough, depending on how you look at it, to say yes to something that they don't know the answer to. And because they know, because they're working in the office, like, hey, I do sales for CloudMine, and I know that John and Ilya and Mark can do anything on the technology side. So whatever I say yes to, like, it can only be so bad, right? Because I know that these guys can, or whatever I promise, they've got my back, right? And, and, and in the early days, that was me. I was the idiot walking around me. Of course we could do that, right? And then come back and be like, I don't know if you should be mad at me or happy with me. Uh, let me tell you what I said, right? Uh, and actually, I'm salesy enough, a lot of times I don't actually remember what I said. I just sort of said something. And so you have to actually have a second conversation with them because I don't remember what I promised them. Um, uh, other than we're awesome. Um, so, so as we've put in more process, there's still a little bit of that. That edge case comes up. Every, every sale, that edge case comes up. And we've had really good success with the people who, who know. And like I said, some people know enough. They're smart enough to know we can deliver. And I think it's actually okay to also just to not know enough to not know when to say no. In both cases, they're putting, together, they're putting forward that aura of confidence and building that relationship with the person. And I'm nervous about an outsource vendor being able to have that, like the same sort of trust with the other side of the house. Um, and from a cultural standpoint, if we outsource that, there's already tension internal in CloudMine as we shift from a product company to a sales company. If we're actually taking that half of the company, 
and taking it out of the company, I can only think that that would get worse. That may be naivete because we haven't actually engaged one of these firms. Um, but that sort of kept us on this side of, uh, of engaging. Um, and, and I think I agree with Bob. I have in my head this thought that at some point when I start to feel like bring in the army because I've got a script and I've got like it's time to just put this in front of 2,000 people right now, that that may be an opening to say, well, we can teach this script to anybody. It might not have to be our anybody. Uh, but that's a little bit, that's still sort of ahead of us in, uh, in growth. Oh, yeah. One more? Do you have one more question? Sure. You guys both talked a little bit about the difference between uh, services and your product. So early on, and especially when you're looking to scale your sales organization, do either of you have any kind of tips or tricks, I guess I would ask, for where do you draw that line? And you both also touched on early on when you're still kind of doing the BD in addition to sales, a lot of it is more, much more hands-on. So you're kind of, there's a blend between what's actually your product that you're selling and where you're actually acting in the case where you client success and you're working really hands-on with them. Is there some point that you can draw that line and say, you know, here's the product, this is what you're paying for. If you want us to do more hands-on, then you actually charge the client for that. So we're just starting to have conversations like that. So like the first version of that conversation, I call it, set it selling ahead of the product. So you sort of sell, we're trying to build something. It may take us two years to have a fully elegant, like what we think the elegant solution to the problem is, and we've got half of that is elegant, and the other half is either on its way there, early testing, or just not there at all, right? But we're putting the story that that's the solution to the client's problem in front of the client, the service side of it is filling in that gap with brute force, right? So we're, they're buying, they're consuming the solution that includes some stuff the platform can't do, and we will either do it from scratch for that client on the clock, and hopefully at the same time we're baking that into the platform because we know that other people are going to leverage it. And if we can do it into the platform on the clock, that's the best possible scenario. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes you, you can get away with that. Uh, so I think where that line is is a really, it's a moving target because each customer engagement has different levels of the nerve that you're uncovering. So it might be so important to one customer that they're willing to pay anything for it, but to another customer, not having it might actually make you win or lose the deal. So you may have to do it that, like a cost of doing business. Like it's gonna be on you to do it, but you can promise this will be in in a month or this will be in in two months. Um, we have a short-term roadmap. We will discuss with customers who want stuff that's on or off that product roadmap. And that's the conversation we're having now that's like a little bit, like maybe phase two of this, of this growth, is to say, hey, we can accelerate something on a roadmap for you. But if this is like you're the only one who's ever asked us for, we'd like to charge, you know, we'll give you a reduced rate off of our services rate to do platform work because we are going to be able to leverage it with somebody else. If it's something that everybody is asking for, we say, hey guys, we're gonna have to do some platform work. It'll be ready by X, but because everyone else uses it, we're not, we're not gonna charge you extra for that. Um, and we try to have that conversation internally about like where do we think on this given gap? Is it like just for customer A or nine of, nine of the next 10 users gonna want it? Like that's the stuff that should be, our product organization should be building that. Um, so I don't know. It's been it's been a very a very amorphous pro uh, process for us of picking like where the line is. Um, I think that you should say early on almost whatever you need to say to close the deal, right? Because if you can't get that, if you can close them with a product of a certain part of the solution and then fill in the rest and the services, and then you do it a second time, you've now done the gap yourself twice. So you know so much more about what that gap actually is. And at least for us with the platform company, we're exposing a platform for somebody to use without us there. It makes us use that piece ourselves twice before we expose it to the wild. Um, so that's, I think it's, we get to be our own alpha testers of the product right there. It's not just us testing it, it's us like deploying it for somebody else. Um, I, just, I don't know if, if your world is uh, the same. Yeah, I think I, I, a lot of that resonates. Um, you know, I, I, despite agreeing with you, I want to point out something that's a little incongruous about that, which is we've, we've said two things now, one of which is that we know, okay, we're in, we're, when you're in this early stage, we know where to draw the line. Here's where we draw the line between charging for services and not. The line is, will anybody else ever use it? 
Uh, and if somebody else will use it, then we are making an investment in our product that has long-term value, and therefore we don't need our customers to always subsidize it. And then earlier on, we basically said that we really were bad at figuring out what parts of our product people were going to use. Uh, so to, to make the distinction and say, oh, this particular thing, we know there are more people who are going to use it, is not always in that moment when you're deciding how to price it. You don't always have the amount of time to do the market research. You don't always have the amount of data from previous conversations to know that there's a very, very, very fine line there. Um, so you get in this really difficult situation where Honestly, if you kind of deep down in your heart really want the business, you find a way to talk yourself into the fact that this thing that you're going to build, that's this weird little widget off on the side of your product, is going to get used by, by everybody one day. Um, it's a really, really hard problem that, that the line gets pretty, pretty blurry on. Um, but I think that there is, uh, there is something to be said for the power of saying no sometimes. Uh, and I think that actually in whether it's in sales conversations or whether it's in internal discussions. I mean, we've got, if you look at our, our product roadmap, we, we recently went through a big process in, in building that out for, uh, for 2014. And there is so much stuff that we want to do and that we think would be valuable and that we know people would use. And then there's the amount of bandwidth that we have. And I think that one of the most powerful things that we did in that process was not saying, yes, we absolutely have to build this. We said, no, this is not going to make the cut this year. Neither is this. Neither is this. And it was kind of that, you know, you, you need to kind of kill your babies kind of, kind of moment. But it's the harsh reality of it's almost like you've got a, an NCAA bracket of features in your product. And you, you know that only the final four are going to make it. So you really need to put them head to head. Um, and I think it, this ties into the services conversation because the real decision around whether your client should be subsidizing you building something is not, is that something in the 64, but is it in the four? Uh, and, and is that thing that really does need to get built really lining up with the, the quote unquote services or the custom work that, that needs to get done? So, I mean, I'm increasingly bullish on uh, asking companies to pay you money for custom work that you're doing, even when it folds into your own product. And the reality is that as you go into bigger and bigger enterprises, that's an expectation. And I think that the, the vendors that they are working with, even when there's not custom work being done, there tends to be a services contract bundled on or something like that. So it's not something that's coming out of the blue or something that's unfair to them to request that there is a certain amount that you charge for a product and a certain amount that you charge for enabling the value of your product. Um, and I'd... Uh, I would push. Uh, I would push to try and get them to to pay um, for for that labor because I think what if we've found anything, it's that uh, it's surprisingly easier than you think um, to get people comfortable with that idea. There's two things I think that are really kind of funny about services in startups. So everyone really likes the SaaS model, right? The second S in SaaS is service. So that MRR that these guys in his former life want is service revenue. All SaaS companies, all their platform revenue is you're selling your software as a service. It kills me when people crucify company service revenue when for these kinds of companies, all of it is. 100% of the revenue, there's platform, there's software services and there might be like professional services. But everyone just says services revenue is awful. That's, that's just me, uh, it's a little tongue in cheek commentary. But even the good revenue is services revenue. Uh, but that makes our world a little bit interesting because it's, uh, Bob's version of this was sort of exposing the value of your product to the customer. They're paying for like access to your project. That's the service that you're giving them. The service is abstracting away something else that they would do with the person with a on-demand license to your software. So part of the, soft, so part of the service is your product. And then the professional services might be helping them use it, training them how to use it. If it's not good enough, building your own product to fill in the gap. Uh, that's customer-driven development, which most investors I've talked to think is the single best and cheapest form of funding a company, customer-driven development, which is also services revenue, right? So this is sort of a fun you know, aside as we pass into the workshop. A lot of the things that we're forced to do and need to do to grow our business, if you call them one thing or call them another thing, it's either the solution for your pain or making your company less valuable. But each of those two things are the same. Something to think about. Are we time to uh, workshop? All right. I think I'm introducing the workshop. All right. Thank you, Adam.
We hope you enjoyed this program from Philly Startup Leaders. For more information, visit phillystartupleaders.org. This program is a production of Professional Podcasts, a division of the Lubetkin Media Companies in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. If you'd like to purchase DVDs of Founder Factory programs, visit our online store, lubetkin.net forward slash cubecart. For everyone at Philly Startup Leaders, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us and take good care.